In 2006, the stars aligned and the greatest motion picture of all time was unleashed upon the world, Tenacious D and The Pick of Destiny starring Jack Black and Kyle Gass. The film was sort of a mashup of musical biopics, fantasy, and comedy, and told a story loosely based on the band's career up to that point. When New Line Cinema agreed to distribute the movie, they expected that Jack Black's rising star power and Tenacious D's loyal fan base would make for a smash hit at the box office. Unfortunately, The Pick of Destiny performed terribly in theaters, not even earning back half of the production and advertising budget spent on the film. In today's video, we'll be discussing the development, failure, and revival of Tenacious D in The Pick of Destiny. By the time that The Pick of Destiny premiered in 2006, the film had been in development for over six years. The synopsis for the earliest version of a Tenacious D movie surfaced in November of 2000, and it is nothing short of insanity. Yes, even more insane than JB and John C. Riley dressed as Sasquatches swimming through a strawberry river. I'm not going to go over the entire synopsis, but the lost continent of Atlantis was key to the story. Apparently, this synopsis was based on an actual screenplay drafted up by a team of outside writers. But Jack and Kyle felt that the script didn't really reflect their sense of humor properly, so they just kind of gave up on it. At that point in time, the band didn't even have an EP, let alone a full-length album. Nonetheless, Tenacious D had already amassed a devoted following. The duo met one another in the mid-80s through the Actors Gang Theater in Culver City, California. Initially, they didn't get along, but as they were forced to work together on music for various productions, they realized, if we joined forces, we could be an indestructible force of entertainment. Powerhouse. Tenacious D started out playing small clubs and bars in the LA area, playing songs that Black described as folk metal with a weird nursery rhyme quality that were also very self-referential. Tenacious D eventually caught the attention of David Cross, one half of HBO's Mr. Show. David invited the band to play some songs during early stage versions of Mr. Show before the HBO series had even kicked off, which led to the creation of a Tenacious D HBO miniseries. Oh yeah, and they appeared in the Pauly Shore movie Biodome in 1996. Their short cameo was probably the best part of that stupid f***ing movie. Due to creative differences between the band and HBO, the first episode aired in 1997, but a follow-up wouldn't be shown for over two years. In that time, Tenacious D continued to grow as they played opening spots for Beck, Pearl Jam, and Foo Fighters. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows because they definitely faced some negativity along the way. Maynard James Keenan of the band Tool was exposed to the D through his friendship with David Cross. He invited Tenacious D to open a few Tool shows in the LA area, and apparently they were greeted with venomous jeers during those performances. But those negative sentiments didn't really seem to matter, because by the turn of the millennium, Tenacious D had built up a solid following and scored a deal with Epic Records in 2000. Their self-titled album was released one year later, featuring polished versions of songs that the band had been playing since their earliest live shows. Tribute was the first song that Tenacious D ever played in a live setting, and coincidentally, it became the band's first hit single. The track was a tribute to the greatest and best song in the world, which wasn't recorded because it was performed on the fly in front of the devil himself. I'm purposely showing the shitty looking version of the music video that someone recorded off of MTV2 because before almost every music video known to man became available to watch on YouTube, some absolute savior uploaded this version to the site and I must have watched it about 100 times. You want to walk away from your dreams or do you want to come in here with me like the tenacious D I know and change rock history? The music video was directed by Liam Lynch, who at that point in time was probably best known for his work on the MTV series Syphil and Ollie but later gained pretty sizable notoriety for the 2002 track United States of Whatever. But Liam continued to work with the band, directing short films that would play during some of their shows, along with the documentary Tenacious D on the Road. While the band continued to tour and release more music videos, progress on a Tenacious D movie was essentially completely halted. But Liam was fully aware that the guys were unhappy with the draft script that they came up with a few years earlier. One day he said to Jack, Dude, we'll write the script together. It'll be your vision. We're gonna have to write a f***ing masterpiece! Jack, Kyle, and Liam spent about a month and a half writing up a draft screenplay. 
Along with the origin story of the band, the driving force of the movie would be a guitar pick of Destiny with a Da Vinci Code conspiracy spin added to it. When the script was finished, they brought it to various production studios. Jack Black alleges that New Line Cinema was really the only studio that believed in the band's vision for this movie, and despite the fact that Liam Lynch had never directed a full-length film, they were more than willing to let him direct the movie. All of this went down in the early part of 2003, but because Jack Black was cast as a major character in Peter Jackson's King Kong, a movie that took like two years to make, production on The Pick of Destiny wouldn't begin until about halfway through 2005. Before shooting began, Tenacious D went into the studio to record another album that would also act as the film's soundtrack. Unlike their self-titled debut album, which was comprised of songs that were pieced together over a number of years, The Pick of Destiny was written much faster because they had a full screenplay to work from for lyrical inspiration. His fingers move at blinding speed, but in my mind he plants the seed. Yeah. Both the debut album and The Pick of Destiny were produced by the Dust Brothers. Their producing talents combined with a final mix by Ken Andrews of the band Failure just pushed these records to another level. Oh. No, no. <laughs> the Pick of Destiny starts out in the town of Kickapoo, Missouri, and JB is the first to admit that quite a few liberties were taken with his origin story in the film. He actually grew up in Santa Monica, and unlike his fictional parents, his actual mom and dad supported his love of rock and heavy metal music. But bending the truth allowed for Meatloaf and Ronnie James Dio to appear in the intro, and created a really good driving force for the first act of the movie. So who really cares? JB makes his way to Hollywood, which apparently took him like 15 years, and eventually finds himself in Venice Beach, where he meets a street musician named Kyle Gass. Yeah! You guys are like electric dynamite. Kyle takes JB under his wing, and they join forces to write and perform songs together, but can't churn out anything that brings in fans. Well, except for one super devoted fan named Lee. You guys changed people's lives tonight. Lee is one of many characters who return from the HBO miniseries, along with the open mic host and Sasquatch, but a few other actors were also brought back to play different characters. When they realize that all of the biggest rock stars use the exact same guitar pick, they venture to one of the most magical places in the world to buy one for themselves, a guitar center in Pasadena. An eccentric former guitar technician by the name of Sebastian informs them that the guitar pick in question, the pick of destiny, or pod, has supra-natural qualities. That's like a whole other level above super. And it can only be found at the Rock and Roll History Museum. By the way, when it comes to ranking my favorite characters played by Ben Stiller, it goes Tony Perkis, White Goodman, Sebastian the Guitar Center Manager. Anyone who has ever shopped at or even just peered into the window of a guitar center knows that there's at least one of these guys in every store. His portion of the film apparently took 20 straight hours to shoot, but it was so worth it. How'd you hear about this? Pepper Dello tell you. The duo journeys to the museum, steals the pick, gets into a car chase that legitimately took seven days to film, and just as they're about to perform their first show with the pick of destiny, they get into an argument and break it in half. We can't pay the rent because we won't be fueled by Satan. <laughs> now the original ending just showed the band walking into the bar to perform a song, but when the film was shown to test audiences, they felt that the ending wasn't climactic enough. So for reshoots, they called in Dave Grohl, had him sit in a makeup chair for 14 hours, and the band had a rock off with the devil himself in a song called Beals of Us. Apparently that ending still wasn't good enough for test audiences, as they felt that Tenacious D's portion of the song wasn't strong enough to defeat Satan. So they went back to the studio and improved the track, reworking pretty much everything starting with the line that involves KG gargling demonic mayonnaise. You're gonna gargle mayonnaise! No. The finished track, which finally revealed the song that Tenacious D was alluding to in tribute, was absolutely worthy of the final scene. The full, uncensored version of the song is incredible, but the clean version defies the laws of nature and is somehow just as good. Sorry, but deactivated lasers with my trick. So what exactly went wrong? How did this movie manage to flop so hard in theaters? Well, when New Line agreed to distribute The Pick of Destiny in the early part of 2003, Jack Black had been appearing in movies and TV shows for over 10 years, but he was probably best known for Orange County, Shallow Hal, Saving Silverman, and High Fidelity. Three PG-13 comedies and one R-rated comedic drama. But when that deal was made, filming had just completed on School of Rock, another PG-13 comedy, although this one definitely aimed at a younger audience than the other PG-13 comedies I just mentioned. I've got a hangover. Who knows what that means? It means you're an alcoholic. What's your name? Freddie Jones. Mm, Freddie Jones, shut up! 
School of Rock was received extremely well and made a ton of money. Jumping ahead three years, Nacho Libre was Jack's first PG comedy as a leading man, and it wasn't reviewed well, but undeniably made a lot of money. With those two films, Jack was becoming synonymous with kids' movies. New Line stated that they were counting on at least some of the fans who flocked to School of Rock and Nacho Libre to buy tickets for The Pick of Destiny. Commercials for the movie even sort of portrayed it as a family-friendly film. The issue was, Pick of Destiny was rated R for pervasive language, sexual content, and drug use. Even if, in my personal opinion, The Pick of Destiny could easily be watched by someone as young as like 11 or 12 years old, it's possible that a lot of parents heard that R-rated warning at the end of commercials and trailers and chose not to bring their kids to see this movie. Also, New Line originally planned on releasing The Pick of Destiny to theaters in summer of 2006, but those reshoots I mentioned forced them to push the film back to November 17th of that same year. Unfortunately, November 17th was already a pretty packed day at the box office, with films like Casino Royale, Let's Go to Prison, and of course, Happy Feet. And if the Jean-Claude Van Damme masterpiece Sudden Death taught us anything, it's that you don't underestimate the power of a penguin. So New Line delayed the movie again to November 22nd. This period of time, both before and after the film's theatrical debut, was captured in a documentary called Detour that was included on Tenacious D's second Masterworks DVD. During that period of time, they were also promoting the album that acted as the film's soundtrack, which had a much different success story than the movie. The Pick of Destiny album debuted at number 8 on the Billboard 200, and the single for Pick of Destiny that released on October 30th reached number 78 on the Hot 100 charts. You would think that the movie would be just as successful, if not more successful, than its accompanying soundtrack, but that unfortunately just was not the case. On the day of the film's release, Jack and Kyle were shown estimating how much money the movie would make on its first day in theaters. I'll go 1.2. 1.2? Um, oh yeah, I'm over that. It's going over that. Today. Unfortunately, Kyle was right on the money. The Pick of Destiny opened alongside Deja Vu and Deck the Halls, which outperformed the movie by double and triple figures respectively. But even Borat, which had been out for almost three weeks, performed better on the film's opening day. Things got even worse on Thanksgiving weekend, as The Pick of Destiny continued to drop lower and lower in the rankings. In the documentary, you can see Jack's confidence dropping with each passing day. At one point, he even questions whether or not America has gotten sick of seeing his face. Maybe this flavor's outlasted its welcome. Jack and Kyle were paraded around to pretty much every talk show or radio show you can think of to promote the film. Of all the late night talk show appearances they made, the one on Conan was the absolute best. The Late Show with David Letterman, on the other hand, tried to give Kyle the shaft by only having Jack on as a guest, which made absolutely no sense because they were going to perform a song together. Jack threatened that if he wasn't able to bring Kyle on with him, he was going to leave and not do the interview. They did eventually agree to have Kyle join Jack during the interview portion of the show, but you can clearly see that they were sort of bummed out after what just happened backstage. Jack and Kyle apparently even considered breaking up the band, because along with the bad theatrical performance of the movie, they were losing money with every live show during the Pick of Destiny tour, because this was their first time touring with a full backing band. Not to mention, Kyle was clearly growing tired of being viewed as second fiddle to Jack and the band. He cut off my picture. I was right over here. These are the kind of sacrifices I have to make. Luckily, things turned around the following spring, when Tenacious D and The Pick of Destiny was released on DVD. Even factoring in advertising costs, DVD sales, and rentals made it so that the movie did eventually turn a profit. The Pick of Destiny isn't for everyone, but for me it became an instant classic. I generally really don't like musicals, but The Pick of Destiny struck such a nice balance between the standard road trip buddy comedy and musical biopics that it just works so damn well. Also, I'd be committing a sin if I didn't mention Tim Robbins' role as a vagrant simply referred to as The Stranger. The scene where he threatens to stab JB and KG outside of the museum is pure comedic gold. I am going to slice out your eyes and your balls, and then I am going to stick your eyes in your ball sacks. Luckily, the film's poor box office performance and some turbulence within the band didn't stop them from continuing on. Six years later, they released Rise of the Phoenix, and the title track literally pokes fun at how hard the Pick of Destiny bombed within the first line of lyrics. Tenacious D has been questioned about a potential follow-up, and they said that they're working on one movie that will act as sort of a hybrid sequel to The Pick of Destiny and School of Rock. I'm pretty sure they were joking, but the fact that School of Rock is owned by Paramount and Warner Media now owns New Line Cinema, I'm not really sure how they'll make that work, but only time will tell.
That'll do it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts and opinions on the pick of destiny in the comments section. And as always, thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.